Well, you think you recognize it, then you look a little hard. <laughs> so it's funny, it looks like Earth, but actually, what's wrong? What's wrong with it? Yeah, too much light. Okay, good. I was just checking to see if you were awake, actually. <laughs> All right, well, in our own galaxy, here's a photograph. I just want to put things into perspective to start out with. This is a real photograph of the galaxy. It's not our galaxy, but we think our Milky Way would look like this if we could take a picture of it from outside. And in this galaxy, we have hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, and we believe that there are upwards of hundreds of billions of galaxies in our universe. So the question is, how many of you here think there's some chance that there's life out there somewhere in these hundreds of billions of hundreds? It's a self-selected audience, I know. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually a further question here, and in fact, this red circle here I was about to mention is just very approximately where we think our sun would be. Actually, it should be probably a little closer with respect to the galaxy center. So the harder question is, where within our own galaxy, with respect to where our sun is, do you think we have a chance to find life on other planets, let's say in the next century? I want someone just to call it an answer, because this is a classroom setting, so. Um, you know, so like, outside the galaxy, like, what range do you think we have with respect to this thought of where we can find signs of life on another planet in a century? So anybody want to take a guess? Size of the dot. Size of the dot. You know what? I'm going to borrow you for answering any more questions. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's actually the size of the dot. It's, it's really, it is really sobering. You know, so maybe that dot a lot bigger than the sun would be. But it's very sobering to think that we have all these hundreds and hundreds of billions of stars out there. But the ones that we can find planets close enough to home where we can search for signs of life in the future, we're really pretty limited in that, in that regard. So what I'm going to do today was I'm going to answer the questions I get asked most often. And these are questions that I get asked by people of all walks of life. So they include students and my fellow faculty inside my field, outside of my field, just, you know, the random, I call them the random people, um, you know, outside of the academic setting. Anybody's interested in all of these questions. And I see my slides aren't really that bright. Is there a way we can dim the front lights a little bit? Let's see if we can figure out how to, how to dim the slides. Okay. Uh, Peter, there may be some switches on the front there that you should be able to control. Oh, right. Okay. Um, okay, well, we'll look around. The first question is, what could aliens see looking at Earth from afar? I mean, we hope they're out there looking back at us. But it's a question we ask so that we know what to look for. If we wanted to look for a copy of Earth, what would we look for? So the first question we ask, people want to know is, what could aliens see looking at Earth from afar? And what's really great about this question is we actually have a picture of what Earth looks like from far away. And this is a real photograph, a real image, taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft when it, when it was 4 billion miles from Earth. Now it's about 10 billion miles. Here's it snapped the picture of Earth. And can anyone see the picture here? It's just one pixel. And if the light is it's more clear, it's this pale blue dot. And do you know why Earth is a pale blue dot? It's actually not because we have blue oceans. Our oceans are so dark, they hardly reflect any light. It's the same reason the sky is blue, because of Raleigh scattering. And I like this image because this red line here it's actually an artifact. It's light that's scattered in the camera optics. But if we were, if aliens from far away are looking back at our solar system, they would see a similar band from zodiacal dust, from our asteroids which collide and dust gets generated that actually reflects light in the red. So this is what Earth would look like from far away. Mm -hmm. How do we know aliens have a sight and seeing like that? Great question. Let's leave that question for towards the end. <laughs> It's actually a really great question because we, let me just answer that in the context of where we're at. It's a really bad, it may be a terrible assumption to assume that planets are like Earth out there. And in fact, we're finding planets of all masses, including planets more, much more, more massive than Earth that may still be rocky. And we don't even know how massive their atmospheres would be. But if massive planets have more thick atmospheres, indeed they won't be able to, the, whoever lives on the surface will not be able to see out. And that'll be a problem. So you're right, for them, um, if they got a space telescope above ground, they could see it. But how would they know to make detectors of visible wavelengths? Good point. So, uh, that's it. And the other thing about Earth, it's not so relevant for our discussion, but Earth is very variable. It varies by about 20% in brightness because the clouds and continents rotate in and out of view. It's kind of a minor point, but for completeness, I wanted to mention it. Now, what we would really want to do, and what we hope that the aliens who are hopefully looking at us at visible wavelengths or infrared wavelengths will do is look back at us and take a spectrum of Earth. And here's data that's also real data, real spectra of Earth. This one um, is it visible in near infrared wavelengths. This is visible wavelengths here in microns, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1.5, 0 
one micron. This is the near infrared, about 2.6 microns. And down here we have wavelengths um, in the mid infrared. Now, on this plot at the top, um, it's the normalized reflectance. So the sunlight that's hitting Earth and reflecting back out. So on Earth, if we had no atmosphere at all, no molecules in the atmosphere, and just a flat surface, the same light that comes in, would, that hits the Earth, would come back out. And this curve would be a straight line. So this curve is very different from a straight line. I'm sure everybody here agrees it's different from a straight line. It's because all these molecular features are absorbing. They're taking out the way light, the visible wavelengths. And it's hard for you to read this red. At least I can't read it from here. But these biggest features, you know what these are? You can read it. You can see it, actually. It's water vapor. And you know, water vapor is actually Earth's most significant greenhouse gas. You don't care about that usually because we're worried about the human-produced gases from industry. But in fact, it's water vapor is the most na natural one. It has these huge features you can see right here. And we hope that we'll be able to see water vapor on small planets because it shouldn't be there in the atmosphere. Water on a small planet on a planet is photo dissociated, and hydrogen, a light gas, can escape to space. So unless there's a reservoir of liquid water at the surface, there shouldn't be water vapor. Here on Earth, all life we know it requires liquid water. So we want to find a sign planet with liquid water. Liquid water is hard to find, but water vapor, vapor will be easier to find. Okay, so it's kind of going through what we see here. Here's Raleigh scattering in the blue, like more light scatters in the blue. This is ozone. This dip here is oxygen. Can everybody see this feature? You know, oxygen fills our atmosphere at 20% by volume. But without light, without plants and photosynthetic bacteria, there would be negligible amounts of oxygen in our atmosphere, something like a billion times less oxygen than there is now. And so that's a really unusual gas. It's highly reactive. It shouldn't be in our atmosphere. And on our planet, it's produced by life. So we're hoping that we can find oxygen on another planet and have enough planetary context in terms of the atmospheric features to be able to rule out false positives. And for us on Earth, for a variety of reasons, we like oxy oxygen as a great gas. <laughs> Down here, I'm showing you a Olivia black body curve. And when I teach my class on radiation in the atmosphere, I just say, we go kind of go through the math and concepts. And I like to describe it as a black body, the black body coming from the surface, with bites taken out of it, where those bites are molecules. And look here at carbon dioxide. Huge feature, right? And you know how much carbon dioxide we have in our atmosphere? It's about 390 parts per million. Tiny, tiny amount. And remember, oxygen made this small feature at 20%, and this made this huge feature at a tiny thing. And I could get into like a whole dialogue about that because that's not the class that I'm teaching this semester. But it's not as relevant for us, only that we can see gases of small and large amounts in atmospheres. And that's what we're hoping to do for exoplanets. That's how we want to be able to eventually see signs of life in another planet atmosphere. So to answer this question, what would aliens see looking at Earth from afar? They would see a pale moon up at visible waypoints with brightness that varies with time. And they've seen atmosphere that has water vapor, oxygen, ozone, and carbon dioxide. Now, our atmosphere has many more things. Those are the big dominant features that sculpt the spectrum that would be the easiest ones to see. Okay, the next question I get, and by the way, please feel free to keep asking questions here. We'll have a more extensive time at the end, but anything relevant to these slides is welcome. Nitrogen comprises the last majority of the atmosphere. Great question. Nitrogen comprises the majority of rats, so why can we not detect it? That's really a good question. Um, nitrogen is a homonuclear molecule, so it's got the same atom on each side. And as such, it just doesn't interact with light in the way that other molecules do. And that's pretty much the reason. It's a simplistic answer, but that's the reason. It has some features with electronic transitions, but its rotation and vibration doesn't connect with radiation. When will we find another? This is what everybody wants to do. And I'm sure that those of you who, are, who uh, read the news about science news in general, you have read about exoplanets a lot lately. It seems like every week there's a new planet that is for a size or a mass or in a habitable zone or this or that or the other. And unfortunately, most of them are probably not habitable. We don't know if they're Earth-like. They're probably, they could be Earth size or Earth mass. But finding a planet just like Earth is actually very challenging. And just to let you know how challenging, we like to use an analogy about trying to find an Earth how hard it really is. And actually, it's really hard to do. Because I want you to know that, again, in visible wavelengths, Earth is much fainter than it's it, than the sun. And it's not fainter, let's say, than the faintest galaxies ever observed by the Hubble Space Telescope for an Earth, let's say, at 10 light years away. The problem is it's right next to a very, very bright host star, the sun. And Earth is actually 10 billion times fainter. 
So you have to find a way to get rid of the flare of the starlight. Now this analogy that's used, it's um, like looking for a firefly next to a searchlight, where that firefly and searchlight are as far away as, let's say, Toronto from here. Really far, really hard to find. But I wanted to show you this image because I was consulting for National Geographic magazine a while ago, and they're really, they, have, they really want to get the real images. So I know most of you have seen the magazine. It's a great magazine. There's a reason. They do their due diligence. They do their homework. And the photographers wanted to take a real picture of this analogy. So they rented the searchlight. You can see how they, it was my job to, my consulting job was to just tell them whether the photo looked realistic or whether it was a good picture or a bad representation. The first thing I said, well, you don't actually see stars like this all clustered together. That was a problem. And the second thing was, you can see in the end they had to fake this because they can't do a 10 billion times dynamic range on their, on their camera. We can't do that and they can't do that. But the best part of what happened is they came back to me and they said, you know, we're really excited, but we can't take the picture of the firefly beside the star, but we can take the picture of the firefly in front of the star, blocking out starlight. And the reason this is so significant is that's pretty much the best way to find planets today is when the planet goes in front of the star, not behind the star. So I was just really excited that people, photographers, they realized the same thing. And you know what they realized? They didn't put it to numbers. But what we call direct imaging, when we look at the planet directly and we want to try to block out the starlight, that's a 1 in 10 billion problem. The problem if you want to look at an Earth-sized planet in front of a sun-sized star, that's a 1 in 10,000 problem, which is still a really hard problem if you think of making a measurement to that many decimal places. It's not as hard as one in 10 billion. So they actually realize what, what we realize also. And that's why we study planets that go in front of the star. So I'm going to explain it to you for those of you who aren't aware of it. This is going to show you a car kind of a cartoon of all any stars like this other than the sun. Now look carefully. Can you see the planet and the cartoon going in front of the sun? And now look at the light curve. That's what we measure is planet brightness as a function of time. And when the planet goes in front of the star, you see a drop in brightness in a very characteristic shape and duration. And then when it's finished crossing the star, it comes back out. Did any of you folks here see the transit of Venus? Yeah? Did your weather from here? Did your weather from here, huh? <laughs> okay. I thought you Anyway, so there's the transit. And the big thing going on in exoplanets now, actually, at this kind of present time, is the Kepler Space Telescope, which, uh, can you get an impression of the diameter of the planet from the light curve? Yes, in fact, you can. But what you really are measuring is the area ratio of the planet to the star. So you have to know something about the size of the star. And people that have various ways of measuring the size of the star. From one, it may sound obscure to people who aren't in the field, but astroseismology, it's like seismology on Earth, astroseismology on stars, people can measure the radius to like 1 or 2%. But for many of the stars, we don't know the radius. And the Kepler team did a job with 150,000 stars they were looking at. And they came up, they took colors and made estimates of size. And they were off sometimes by 30%, which is a lot if you think of a planet. Is it 2 or 3 ADI or 1.5 you know, or 3 ADI? So it, you can make an estimate of the size of the star, but it's actually required to find out the size of the planet. So yes, we do get sizes of planets that way. Mm -hmm. It's a very weak signal to start with. That's also response to noise generated by the variation related to the star itself. Correct. Also, atmospheric changes might probably will affect the human So, how does that all other stuff filter up? Great question. And you just reminded me, I actually forgot to put the slide that I wanted to show. So, let me pick another time. I'm going to pull that up the slide. I guess I'll just pull it up from the top. But right now, here's just an artist picture of Kepler, it's a space telescope, it's about a one meter aperture. It's in what we call an Earth trailing orbit. So as the sun, Earth goes around the sun, so does Kepler, but it's trailing behind Earth. And that's, well, not only above Earth's atmosphere, but it's far enough away from Earth, much further than the Hubble Space Telescope or the International Space Station. So it's even away from the effects that you get from scattered light from Earth and other problems. It's in a really great environment. Now Kepler's looking at 150,000 stars at one time. And the person who was the PI of the mission he called it jokingly the most boring mission ever because it does the same thing. Every six seconds, it snaps uh, uh, the same image over and over and over again. It's trying to get those points on that curve um, to see if the planet drops in brightness. So yes, it's very hard. There's a lot of effects. But everything humanly possible was done to make this telescope suitable, including the observing strategy, including the field of stars, including the orbit. 
to make this actually possible. I'm going to show you some real data um, from Kepler in a minute. But I wanted to get back to the galaxy in Kepler. Here's another picture of our galaxy. Artist conception again, showing you our sun is out here. The Kepler field is basically there. It's not so relevant for our talk right now. But before getting to the real data and what Kepler is doing, I want to show you a couple of cartoon pictures of what Kepler has found. And this is um, an artist's illustration, just rendering where the plants are. This is supposed to be the sun and Jupiter. Can you guys all see Jupiter on here? Jupiter is about a tenth the diameter of the sun. And you can see all the stars. Some of this is just a small sample of the ones Kepler has found. I mean, you can see big stars, smaller stars, and bigger planets. Some of them you can't see because of the resolution of the screen, but you can see small planets and just where it's crossing on the star. All that information is in the light curve. But what's interesting is Kepler has also found a lot of multiple planets. And this particular representation is showing you the planets um, all scaled to each other in terms of time, and the bigger circles mean bigger planets. There's a little animation that goes with this. <laughs> but some of these are just absolutely phenomenal systems. Kepler has found one system called Kepler-11, which has six planets, and five of them are in orbit, which would be interior to Mercury's orbit. Let's play this one again, just so you can... So all of these planets are discovered to transit these multiple systems that all the planets are in the same plane. Okay, so I'm actually going to walk you through some real data for those of you interested to see how we can actually use these detections. And this is a Kepler 10 light curve. And I think I, I'm not going to be able to pull up that slide I wanted to show you, but let's just say this is the process data. Um, the real data would look like this. And then there'd be a gap, and then it would come back down, and then there'd be like little problems when the battery's in the thermal cycle, the effects in the detector, and stuff's all over the place. But what you do is you see these so-called systematic effects and try to remove them from the data. And ultimately, through a lot of data processing, you get down to this. Now, what you're seeing here is time and days. So this is almost one year. And you can also, this is relative brightness. And I want you to, for a moment, look at the numbers here, the number of decimal places there. And think about whatever you work on, whether it's a whether you're doing like the junior physics lab or you're making measurements in a lab for biology or physics, what measurements do you do that go to that many decimal places? Because I want you to appreciate just the difficulty level uh, that people went through here. I can see people count them. Yes, it's very tiny. Now here you see some scatter. This is just photon noise. It's just scatter um, in the data. And these gaps here, actually, when the telescope is not taking data, sometimes the telescope goes into safe mode where there's a kind of a problem and it shut and stops taking data until engineers can figure out what's wrong with it and, and fix it. Other times it stops to send data down to Earth, and then it's also not taking data. Now I wonder if you can see the transits here. They look very different from the picture I showed you before, because the picture before spanned about five hours, and this is spanning 300 days. <coughs> it, it's actually these. It's hard to see because it's compressed this way. So if we take a look at this data, so this is essentially what the computer's doing. Is looking at 150,000 stars and looking for drops in brightness and uh, trying to find fancy planets. There it is. Um, this planet has a period of 45.29 days. Now let's zoom in here. I'm going to ask you the same question again on a much shorter time scale. So this is the same data as before. The blue line is showing you the transit from before, but now the scale is different. And this is um, smaller, and this is now 10 days. Now the question is, can, now the question is, can you see the transit? a second planet transiting with a different frequency and a different depth. Now it's interesting, some of you say yes, you may see a periodic phenomena, you may not. But that's not how Kepler's looking for data. I'll show it to you. What Kepler does actually is it phase folds the data. So it takes chunks of data and folds them together looking for planets. Like let's say it looks for a planet on a five day period orbit. It takes all the data and every five days it just averages a ch chunks of Five, and then it shifts in phase and does that again, and again, and again, and again, and then searches for a signal. Because Kepler's not expected to see, wasn't designed to find signals like that. It would have to be much bigger and much more complex. So when the data gets in together, you know what it looks like? It looks really different, but that's what it looks like. That is um, the data folded together. And it's a very short period. That particular planet is called Kepler-10b. It's a 0.85 day period orbit. So there's a lot of 0.85 chunks in data that lasts for almost a year. So here's the data. And this answers the question about finding, it doesn't answer, it's showing you like a schematic 
What I love about the scene is that it looks, doesn't it look almost like this fake curve? <laughs> so great. I think it's really, really exquisite. And actually here um, in Vancouver, if some of you know Jamie, Professor Jamie Matthews at the University of British Columbia, he's running the most space telescope, Canadian space telescope, that has been on one planet to transit called 55 Cancri E. It's a closer star than the Kepler stars, and one that we're all excited about. Well, the second technique I wanted to mention is another planet-finding technique that helps, that actually measures the planet mass. And this technique relies on a Doppler shift due to a stellar wobble, which also has its origins here at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And it's showing you that as the planet, it's exaggerated, that the star and the planet orbit the common center of mass, and the star can be a period to come towards you and go away from you. And Doppler measurements, measuring the Doppler shift, can actually pick that up. And here's showing you orbital phase and velocity. Um, there's a couple points I want to make here, but one of them is, see the curve um, hits the data, okay, but not super great. It's really challenging to make this measurement because with Kepler, it's taking all the photons at visible wavelengths from about 0.4 to about 0.8 nanometers. For spectra to get the Doppler shift, you have to spread all that light out into different wavelengths. And you have fewer photons per bin of measurement. So it's always harder to get the planet mass than it is to get the planet radius. But the point that I really wanted to make with these two techniques, you can get the planet size from the, because from the transit light curve, you get the planet size. And from this technique, you get the planet mass. And you actually can get an average density. And this is really exciting for us because it means that we can measure the planet's average density and we can determine whether it is likely to be a rocky planet like Earth or whether it should be something else more like light, el light gas and light elements more like Uranus and Neptune or Jupiter. So I'm going to continue this part of my talk. When we find another Earth, this depends on how we define Earth. And we're a bit like the people looking for their lost keys under the streetlight when the keys could be anywhere. We just want to do something because we want to find planets. We're driven to find planets that could be hosting life, but we don't know how common our Earth is. And now I'm going to show you one of my favorite plots of all of science. And this is a plot of known planets. And actually, I updated this just this morning, so you can have the very latest. And this is showing you the mass and Earth masses and semi-major axis, that is planet star distance, in units of Earth's distance. We call it astronomical units. Now, this is on a logarithmic scale. Look how many orders of magnitude this is covering. Huge numbers, right? And our solar system planets here are in red. Mercury, Mars, Venus, Earth, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, Jupiter. The point now is like to make is Venus and Earth are basically the same size, the same mass, almost the same distance from the star, and they're very different at the surface. But what do you see about this diagram? What I like about it so much is that it's all filled in you know, up here almost completely filled in, but you can see certain chunks of data. All the different colors are different planet-finding techniques. I'm not going to describe them today. It's just so you know they're not only different techniques, but they all have selection effects. They all favor different types of planets. The one in green here transiting, it favors planets closer to the star because they have a higher probability to transit. Um, direct imaging focuses favors ones very far from the star. And microlensing with these blue marks, that gets ones in the middle primarily. And you can kind of see an envelope here where it's fair to say that the dark parts of this diagram are dark because pretty much no planet finding technique can find planets there. It's not dark because there aren't planets with those masses and sizes. Um, but why I love this plot is because it shows that in exoplanets, anything is possible. Meaning that planet formation is a stochastic process, it's a random process, and each planetary system will, may actually, come up with the different types of sets of planets. And that's really pretty exciting. We didn't know this before. Um, I was just going to joke that a lot of you might not have even been alive back then, but there was a time when people believed that we knew how planets formed. We had big planets like Jupiter, far from the star, and small planets like Earth and Venus closer to the star. And that's how people built a science. And so it's a great example of science of only having one example. And the way that that paradigm came crashing down. Because you know what it turned out so far? That, that the most common type of planet we know about so far actually are not Jupiter-sized planets, but they're actually Neptune-sized planets. Smaller than Neptune, actually. And this is really shocking for people who had a theory of planet formation. And I liken this theory of planet formation to, I kind of call it like the Microsoft theory of planet formation. When a planet starts growing and gets so big that nothing else around it can get big. And the planet grows and grows until it sort of creates solid particles and dust and gas and gets bigger and bigger until it passes a threshold where the planet will just, will, will just go kind of unstable and capture all of the gas around it gravitationally and just clear out the feeding zone and capture everything until its gravitational influence like just doesn't reach past that point. 
that's sort of the standard picture of how planets form. Um, there's one competing theory that they form just by collapse of part of the disk, but both of those generate bigger planets, more massive planets. So what Kepler and microlensing have found, actually, is that it's smaller planets, about twice the size of Earth, for which we have no solar system analog, are actually the most common planet out there. So this is actually sobering, and it's sort of an interesting concept. We actually don't know. I'm going to go to a more technical plot now. This is the cartoon histogram, and it's not complete or anything, but certainly it's complete down to these Neptune sizes, and I'm just going to give a few aside for the people who um, are closer to the field who can follow all the amount of information I'm going to give you. But it's only complete out to maybe half to three quarters of an astronomical unit. So they, Kepler can't find the planets with the much longer periods. But we have evidence from other planet finding techniques that this still holds. And it's not complete down here because Kepler can't find the really small ones. But I wanted those of you who are interested in seeing a kind of graph that involves a completeness whereby you know, small planets can't be found around every hundred, every one of the 150,000 stars in the Kepler field because some of them are too variable or they're too faint. But if you go star by star and you say, what is the smallest planet I can find? And you're sort of normalizing properly. This is the graph that the Kepler, that um, people working with the Kepler data have come out with. You can see 1% of stars have planets about 8 to 11 with radii. Jupiter's 11 with radii. Saturn is 8 with radii. But down here, 10% of stars have planets of 2 to 2.8 Earth radii. And Neptune is 4 Earth radii, Earth is 1 Earth radius. So actually, it's pretty puzzling. And we don't know what's happening here because these smaller planets will take more data to accumulate. So what this picture we're getting here is with the diagram of the planets all over the place. Oh, question? Um, sorry, the limitation on the period of the planets that come through the mm -hmm. that's, I can imagine, some of the contributions to that, but what's, what's the uh, problem with the string? Is it because of noisy data or is it because of length of observation? The first the, the question is, what is the limitation here? And the first one is length of observations. Kepler needs to see at least two, preferably three transits to get a period. Two to get a period because you see it twice, and the third one to confirm. So if Jupiter's period is 10 years, 12 years, so that would be 12 times 3, 36 years to nail Jupiter. Mm -hmm. Is there any correlation between the uh, mass of the star and the planets around the mass of the planets? Good question. Is there any correlation between the mass of the planets and the mass of the stars? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is actually detected that small stars, really small stars, appear to have small planets, and bigger stars like the Sun could have bigger planets. But any higher fidelity than that is not yet known. So we have stars that are like half the mass of the Sun or less than that. They actually appear to just have mostly small planets, and they don't have massive planets like Jupiter that we know of. So it's clear in the extreme corners that sort of in between there's not a high level of fidelity. Most of them are sun-like stars by choice, and the stars that are not sun-like that are much smaller, the Kepler team actually ignore, but other people in the community are working on those other stars. So in fact, there's a plot like this. If you want to go to this paper, you know what this is? This is an astrophysics archive. If you just sort of Google this, um, this paper does break it down into the different star types also. So what is this telling us? If you want to just type that in, I'll wait till the <laughs> next slide. You know, is, look, I'm just trying to convey one thing theory. So if you didn't miss what I was saying, or if you kind of put out for a minute, I'm just saying planets are so diverse, we, I feel like we really have no clue. And this actually all does feed into the search for life um, on other worlds and what we can really expect. So um, I've given you just a smattering of what we've been finding here. Remember, I'm still in the question, when will we find another Earth? And I've shown, I tried to tell you that something we're starting to learn about, the statistics of the small planets. Um, and here's just a cartoon showing how different they are. But it's very, very hard to find a planet like Earth because it's just hard to find an Earth around a big, massive star, a relatively bigger, massive host star like the Sun. So this whole field actually is part of the field is switching directions to actually look for bigger Earths around small stars. And I wanted to take a minute to explain that because the question of when we find another Earth, it's, you know, one of the answers is a very long time for Earth, but it's actually a much shorter time if we just are willing to broaden our definition of Earth. So here I'm using the concept of the so-called habitable zone, which I'll get into more detail tomorrow in my physics program. And in this particular case, if you assume that you have a planet like Earth with an Earth-like atmosphere at this distance from the sun, <coughs> we can actually calculate, like if this was a physics class or any undergraduate science class, I would actually do the equation. It's not that hard, hard to figure out. But for here, we're just going to do it qualitatively. At this distance, um, we want to know what is the surface temperature for liquid water, given an atmosphere kind of like Earth. But like if you take a much smaller star, a star that's, let's say, half as massive as the sun, and much less luminous, the energy from the sun that's heating the planet 
is weaker. And that same temperature will require the planet to be much closer. And I draw this like relatively to scale. It's not absolute in any way, but relative to each other. This is how close it would be. Well, this was the Earth's sun distance. And a planet around an M6 star would be very close. And this is pretty amazing because all those things we're waiting for, like the period, if you need to see it go around multiple times, this particular example I chose is 13 days. So every 13 days it will go around. It's easier to find by the radio velocity method, which relies on the mass difference between the planets. And so actually, this is a way that people think they can, uh, planets can be found in many searches going on to do that. Now, um, one thing I do in my work is model atmospheres of exoplanets and basically apply physics, uh, write computer codes, and try to see what the planet will look like when it's made of based on the mass radius and atmosphere data. But instead of going into details about my models, let me take you on a virtual trip to a habitable world. And this is the type of planet people are hoping to find. And there's sort of a joke in this field that um, an Earth, super Earth inhabitable zone of the star has been found again and again and again. And it's announced all the time, but sometimes they're announced and then it's found to be wrong. Like in this particular case, this planet that was made by this artist that was illustrated here was one of the first examples. It was called Gliese 581c. And what was interesting, this was a number of years ago, but the authors had kind of fudged everything in their favor. Because they knew how far the planet was from the star. But if it had an atmosphere like Earth, in order not to be too hot, it had to be very reflective. You know, Earth, I know it feels reflective on like if you're flying on a plane and you're looking down at the clouds or if you're skiing, it looks really bright. But actually, Earth is not that bright. Its albedo is 0.3. That's 30% of the light that hits it comes back, not, not more than that. And their planet had to be about 70% albedo. Well, Venus has a 70% albedo, but it's covered in photochemical clouds, not convective clouds, but photochemical clouds, hydro, sulfuric acid clouds. So actually, they had to kind of push all that. And if you relax that and really made it more like Earth, there's just no way it would be too hot. But don't worry. There's another planet called Gliese 581 d which would be on the outer edge of the habitable zone, which if more massive planets have more massive atmospheres and more massive greenhouse, that one can be habitable. So I'm sort of joking here, but I'm just saying that planets are diverse. There's a lot of them out there. And we will have we are getting to the point where they, there have to be a lot of habitable planets because we're finding a lot of things that could fit the description. Now back to the virtual trip to a habitable world. So one thing I didn't mention was for the planets very close to the star, they become tidally locked. That is, they show the same face to the star at all times, just like the moon does to Earth. It's a low energy state, and it happens probably in millions of years. Question? What distance are these stars from here? Okay, good question. I'm actually going to back up because this is a really interesting, this is a really relevant um, question. So bear with me for a minute while I explain it. The Kepler stars are about 1,000 to 3,000 light years away. That would be this far on the scale of our galaxy. And that's what we call pretty far. I mean, it doesn't look that far for our galaxy, but it's not right next door. Because they wanted to see 150,000 stars at one time to beat down the probability issues, because not all stars will be lined up just right so that they go in front of the star as seen from the telescope. When we're talking about the small stars, they're really big. And so those can only really be seen quite close to the sun, like maybe hundreds of light years. <laughs> um, most of the other techniques are looking at hundreds of light years, except for microlensing, which uses gravitational lensing from an unseen object. The background stars are here, and those objects are halfway between us in the center of the galaxy. So kind of looking like, let's say, Okay, so back to the virtual trip of the world, I want you to bear, imagine you're going to this planet. So the planet is so close to the star uh, that the same face of the planet points to the star at all time. And what this means is that the star would be in the same part of the sky at all times. It would never set, it would never rise. So what part of the planet would you go to if you could go to this planet? Would you go where the sun is always setting? Your vacation where it's always sunset? Well, the astronomers here would have to go where it's always dark, so you can see the night sky. You can go where it's always day. Um, one interesting thing about these planets is for the children in the audience, you know what? This planet's year, that means the time it takes to go around its star, is about 13 days. So your birthday would happen every 13 days. <laughs> Which the kids like that, but for the parents, that would just be <laughs> Now, one thing you can see here is how big the star would be in the sky. Because you're so close to that star, you know it's a small star, it's huge in the sky. And this is showing you other planets in the same system. Here's one transient, here's this. You know, if you think about this more, at second thought, it might not be a great place to visit or to live because these small stars are very active, most of them. Even the ones that are quiet are actually quite active. That means they send out flares, flares with harmful ultraviolet rays and they emit cosmic rays, 
cosmic ray high energy particles coming to that planet. And so some people question whether it's a good idea to think whether life couldn't survive on the surface of these planets with so much damaging radiation. Other people worry that when these planets form close to the star, because of time scales of planet formation and delivery of volatiles like water, that they may have trouble gaining water. But what we've seen so far is that most theories turn out, I'm just joking when I say most theories turn out to be wrong, but it shouldn't ever prevent us from looking. So right now, that's what, uh, what people are working on. So to summarize, when we find another Earth, finding a big Earth around a small star, we could probably identify one around the end of this decade. That's actually, seems like a long time away, but it's actually pretty short, considering how things are, are going in this field. And what would have to happen is we have to find a sample of big Earths around small stars that we think are habitable. Those are the ones you read about in the news. And then we have to wait till a big space telescope that's being built right now gets launched. And, and that's why it takes till 2018. So that's what we're hoping to do. And that was like a nutshell summary version of when we'll find another Earth, meaning an Earth whose atmosphere we can look at and try to identify molecules in the atmosphere. So then the question is, can we go there? And this actually is a question I get asked most often. Really, really. And this is a really interesting question because I think a lot of you know the answer. And so before we talk about the next one, let's talk about distances. If this is our sun, and this is our, this is our sun, and this is actually a real picture of our sun, I would like uh, someone to guess how big Earth would be compared to this sun. And except for you, you're not allowed to guess. Okay, well how, one one hundred? And that, can you see on here? Look. That's actually not Earth, that's a sunspot. I don't know if that's it's probably bigger than one hundred, but okay, Earth is like about the size of the sunspot. Where do you think Earth would be in this room, or in this building, or on this campus, or in this city, if it's that size, and that's the size of the sun, and that dot is the size of the Earth? So I guess you could raise your hand if you think it's about where you're at. Someone's going to guess, but I can give you the number. I mean, if I was mean, it would actually make you work it out, because the numbers actually aren't that hard. Um, one Earth-Sun distance is about 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters, and the sun is about 1 times 10 to the 9 meters. Let's call it 100, I guess. Uh, which was it, let's call it about 100. So it would be about 100 diameters of the sun. So you can probably guess where that would be. I can actually, I don't think it's in this room, it's somewhere. Yeah. Over here. Really, I don't think it's that far. <laughs> somewhere out there, so it's 100. Okay, so it seems kind of far, at least to me. That seems like a big distance. Now the question is going to be, where's the next star? And we kind of actually already answered this question before, because remember the searchlight? But where do you think the next star would be? You can guess now, I already told you kind of the answer. It'll be somewhere on the East Coast. Montreal. Montreal, okay, let's think of Montreal. <laughs> so Montreal, so you're supposed to think about that for a minute. If that's the size of that side of Montreal, really far away, that's far, and that's the nearest star. And the next stars are further and further and further. So the question, can we go there, relates to those very vast distances. When you see the picture of the galaxy, I don't know how it looked to you, but it looks like there's a lot of stars nearby. But they're not, they're just bright, they're very far away. And so we can answer this question partially by talking about the Voyager 1 spacecraft, which actually is still traveling out to past our solar system. And they're just reaching the edge of our solar system, or just past the edge of our solar system, traveling at 20 kilometers a second. So you have to convert that to kilometers per hour to be meaningful, but that's fast. How many seconds in an hour? There's so you know, just multiply 20 by how many seconds an hour. That's really, really, really fast. But Voyager 1 would take like tens of thousands of years to get to the nearest star. And that's even if it was going in the right direction to the nearest star. So that's a long time. But the message I want to give to you, actually, is that uh, people are really excited about the nearest star because in the last few weeks, you may have heard an announcement that a planet has been discovered around the nearest star, Alpha Centauri B. It's a binary, it's a triple system but around one of the stars in the component of the binary. And uh, where there's one planet that's in a short period orbit, like the one that was discovered is, there's usually more. So actually, um, people are excited about this. And for a long time in the sort of space engineering community, people have been talking about sending a probe, even if it does take tens of thousands of years. But more than that, there are people now who really are working to try to understand how spacecraft can go much faster. And here, I am going out a bit on a limb here, but I just wanted to plant the seed of big ideas. And people consider whether there's some way to travel at a tenth the speed of light. And you'd have to do a lot of things, not only improve your technology, but you'd have to launch from away from Earth's gravity, or at least in low Earth orbit. You'd have to assemble your spacecraft somewhere where you don't have to 
you know, use a lot of your fuel just to get your mass above Earth's gravity. And the question I wanted to pose to you is that imagine this is possible at some time in the future. And I have actually been reading a lot of science fiction on the plane, like that right here. But imagine if there's some way that you could get, you could travel the tenth speed of light, and it would take this nearest star's says four light years away, forgetting about accelerating and then slowing down. It would take about 40 years. So if you wanted to go there, if someone would volunteer to go into hibernation and travel to that inner star, that would take about 40 years. So you know what the perfect age is to go to that inner star? I'm going to guess now. It's about, it's about 20 years old. Because you're 20 years old, you're you know, old enough to make decisions that you might not regret later. <laughs> when you get there, if you're 60 years old, you're actually still young enough to carry out research and exploration. So I just want to know if there's anyone here who feels the capability to go there today and would go there. Okay, so there's all these people who go. I mean, that's why humans are just driven to the floor. Now, the part I forgot to mention was if you get there when you're 60, you're probably not going to be able to make the return trip. <laughs> so I just want to know if you're still volunteer. And maybe people will still go. And we see that again and again. That's why I believe that someday people will find out the way to go. And in fact, there's this project called the 100 Year Starship. It was initially sponsored by DARPA, an American organization that sponsors research that's really difficult. And the unfortunate thing is they sponsor really hard research, but once it looks possible, then they pull the plug. But then there's no funding for that in-between stage, where it's not impossible, but it's actually not quite possible. And they actually started funding this thing that people meet every year. And a former astronaut has now taken the helm of an organization, which you know, they're not claiming they're going to build a spaceship that can go to Alpha Centauri, but they just fund technology on how to make things go faster. So can we go there, even though it's an exciting topic, not for now. And so the follow-up question I get, not so much, actually no, I do get this from scientists also, is <laughs> if we can't go there, why look? Are we just stamp collecting, or why are we doing this? And you know, I wish I could answer that right now, but that's tomorrow's talk. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not just trying to advertise, it's really getting to be close to an hour, so, you know, we actually want to study interiors, atmospheres, and biocentric acids. We want to know what planets are made of, we want to understand how planetary systems form and evolve, and that's why we're doing this. But I guess I will talk very briefly um, about some biosignature research. And I've always been really motivated by this study from the American National Academy of Sciences. I have a bit of an American bias here, even though I'm Canadian born, and excuse me for that. But this quote from this long report called The Limits to Life and Habitable System, it, the, limits to life, the Limits to Organic Life and Planetary Systems. And what's really cool about this report is it's the first group that kind of gave people permission, if you will, or said, let's drop some of the things that we take as gospel. Like, does life really need liquid water? They say, well, you know what, for organic, I'm not an organic chemist, but they say for organic chemists, and uh, they'll say, well, water is too good of a solvent. It, it destroys a lot of things. But in this report, they said, well, you need some kind of liquid where molecules can break up and form different molecules. You need temperatures where covalent bonds can form so that more complicated molecules needed for life can occur. And so they sort of revisit things and they give us, give, I will say some guidelines, but they just say, you know, forget about Earth itself and let's think a little bigger. Um, so despite that, we take heart on Earth because life lives in so many extreme environments. And this is an astrobiology slide that I just picked up. Um, I'll get into this in more detail tomorrow, but in exoplanets, we do um, think about life, like on Earth, Life operates with chemistry, stores energy in chemical bonds and extracts energy from the environment from chemical potential energy gradients. And so as long as we believe that life uses chemistry everywhere, it should generate metabolic byproduct gases. And ultimately those should um, go to space. So I'll just talk about, uh, I'm gonna end with a couple of slides on what I do and then we can open it up for questions. But I was mentioning to you how I do a lot of complicated models. Um, and I just have a cartoon slide. Basically, it's like one PhD and then repeated to do each of these things. So we try to understand Earth's and Earth's interior, or geofluxes that can come out, like the methane on Mars, or the former methane on Mars, and the biofluxes, but all those mix in the atmosphere. And we have to understand photochemistry, because the sunlight or starlight, ultraviolet light, breaks up molecules, and it ends up creating radicals that just set off the chemistry in a completely different path than if there was no ultraviolet radiation. And then um, we have little telescopes we hope to be observing those atmospheres from afar. But I just want to post to you one thing for the, um, in case there are any biologists or chemists in the room. And this is what we're really hoping to do and we're kind of trying to work on right now. And what we found for biosignature gases is that on Earth, life creates so many chemicals, huge, huge numbers, thousands or probably even tens of thousands of chemicals, untold numbers. And the question is, how can we get a handle on this? Because despite all of my enthusiasm, 
it, at the end of the day, we're not going to have a million planets to look at. Our nearest neighbors, our nearest sun-like neighbors, that even when we can go to space and you know the firefly and the searchlight block out the starlight and look at the planet light, even when we were able to do that, we're not going to have a huge number of planets to look at. It's going to be limited. And so we're going to want to be aware of all the possible biosignature gases. And I'm starting to think that it's, it's, there's just a lot of, we don't know what else we do. So what we'd like to do is look at all small molecules. And when I say this, there's a lot of them. But if you imagine taking all molecules, all small molecules, you could just generate these on a computer. And then you say, well, which ones are stable? Both stable and volatile. Volatile means that they can live in your atmosphere as gas. Stable is that they have some lifetime and they won't break apart right away. And then I'm going to skip this, but we ask, can they be detectable from afar? And that relates to some plausible biomass. That's not like you need, you know, 100 kilometers thick of life to produce a signal that one could detect from far away. And then we want to know, you know, is there a geophysical false positive or a likelihood of geophysical false positive? So ultimately, if we want to hope to find life on other planets, we actually um, will have to have some understanding of how we're going to identify gases that don't belong and what some of those gases could be. So another reason we work on exoplanet, now I'm going to remember, can we go there? If not, why look? We actually have a huge interest from the public, and I'm just showing you a couple of pictures here. This was from the New York Times um, a couple of weeks ago about the Alpha Centauri system. It's a binary star system with a third one further out that's showing you the Alpha Centauri B and Alpha Centauri A and the planet around it. I was showing you my students building, and I have time to talk about some of my work in space um, engineering, aerospace engineering, that they're working on this small space telescope we're hoping to put into space. And here, um, I'm just kind of going far on topics, but just for people in the audience who are interested in how we would directly image another planet, I wanted you just to know that people are working on this. And one idea is to put a huge special screen in space, really far from the space telescope, tens of thousands of kilometers from the big space telescope. And that screen can't be a square or a circle because of diffracted light. It has to be a very special shape. And that special shape turns out to be almost like a flower with petals that have a very um, mathematically described shape. It's called a hypergaussian, going out to a tip. And I know that all sounds crazy, and some of you may have missed what I said, but I wanted you to see here are two of my students went to JPL. Um, our class that was building this was funded partly by JPL, so the students got to go to JPL. And this here is one of the petals at two-thirds of the size. When I said big screen, the screen is like 70 meters across, would be. And they were actually just, this reminds me of some of the Star Trek series where, you know that one, the Star Trek series where the Star Trek series where they're showing the primitive Earth, not primitive, but when the Earth finally figured out how to go to space. I think people are going to look back at us like that because what they were trying to do was unfurl this, show how it might unfurl. You can see how it's like, do not cross state. And that's what the students got to pose in front of. So um, I think I'm going to end there and I'll say, if we can't go there, why look? Remote sensing of planetary interiors, atmospheres, and biosignature gases, STEM education, and just you know, inspiring innovation and space technology. Now I just have a couple of summary slides. So I went over the questions that I get asked most often. What could aliens see looking at Earth from afar? They could see gases if they could do spectroscopy. The big uh, dominant gases, most spectroscopically active gases, and I mentioned carbon dioxide, water vapor, oxygen, and so on. When will we find another Earth? That one my pop was kind of all over the place because I tried to update you on some things going on in exoplanets and to let you know that Kepler is doing a census of, Earth size, of planetary sizes. And when we find another, that was, I really didn't give you a great answer to that. I think I said, the directly imaged Earth will wait a long time, but if we go for the big Earth around the small star, that can really be within a decade. Can we go there? We talked about that. We can't go, although some of us would like to. And if we can't go there, why look? I, I finished with that. And I will just end with this picture, this is really for the amateur astronomers among us, that what we'd really like to do is, you know, we want to change the way that people see our universe. And in astronomy, we like to think about uh, how we view our place in the universe, starting with before Copernicus, when he thought that Earth was the center of the universe, the center of everything, that all the stars and planets all revolved around Earth. And it turned out Copernicus, before the theory, which took about 100 years to accept, that Earth was not the center, but in fact, all the planets revolved around the sun. And then people thought the sun was the center of the universe. Then astronomers found that we were actually in a galaxy, or orbiting a galaxy, and actually there are many other galaxies out there. And so we think of finding another planet like Earth, as we like to call it, completing the Copernican revolution. We find that another planet like Earth that may have signs of life on it, we will know that we're not the only ones out there. We'll remove ourselves from being the center of everything. Finally. Thank you.
zones where uh, common and combinable elements exist in their uh, gaseous, liquid, and solid uh, phases together <coughs> so that you get a kind of a vocabulary for structure and function. Yes, that is a great point. And actually, there is another environment where we think that happens, and that's tight. That has liquid methane and methane lakes. And we get, that gets tricky for us because, again, like I think to be on both sides of the fence about terracentricity and not terracentricity. But we look at the solar system and we say, well, which elements can have that property? Which ones can have molecules that can exist in liquid form and in vapor? There's actually very few that actually would exist in abundance. So close to our sun, there's liquid metal, well, inside planets, which is way too hot. And as you go further and further out, there aren't a lot of choices until you get out to our tightness and you start getting liquid methane and ethane. But people do hope that there could be signs that there could be life on Titan. Hi. Uh, so I guess JWST, like James Bell Space Telescope, is kind of going to be a successor to Kepler in a way that is going to be involved in exoplanet detection. But is there actually like a, a direct planned successor to Kepler, considering how successful it's been? And what's the lifetime of Kepler? Uh, how much longer is it going to be? Okay, good question. Well, let's answer the first question of Kepler. What's Kepler's lifetime? Kepler's was planned to be three and a half years. For the same question we had about how long does it take to find a planet, you want to see the planet go around twice to get established a period, and once more to be sure of that period. And you may not see it in the first month of the mission, so make it three and a half. But then what happened was it, it Kepler has an extended mission and it needs to go for seven years because even though Kepler worked perfectly, stars are more variable than we expected. We need twice as much data to actually get down to the original planet. Now fortunately the data is like white noise, it's random, and that's great. And you know what happened? Kepler has been, so if you're an engineer, this is really, uh, this is all very meaningful because Kepler was built with redundancy four reaction wheels. It needs three reels, one on each axis, to point in a certain direction at the stars it's looking at. And if it can't point at all, it can't do the job. And one of those reaction wheels failed recently. And you say, well, okay. That reminds me of when you have a washing machine that has a guaranteed date when they'll fix it for free, and then it breaks the same day after that's over. Usually the space people do a better job. But in this case, something went wrong with the wheel and it's not working. Which is fine, because there's still three others. But you know, if one wheel went wrong and they can figure out what that was, there's concern that another wheel will go wrong before we get to the answer. And we're just so close. Remember I showed you the plot of the statistics? And around Earth size planets, there's a big question mark. So we're hoping that it stays until it's time. Um, and then we can go into details later about what else will ruin its lifetime. It can keep going for a long time, actually. It has enough fuel to do the maneuvers it needs to do, so that's not a problem. Now the question is, is there any planet successor? Well, you know, the whole it's not just the whole world that whose economy is tanking, but there's kind of a big problem, and we're sort of all seeing this every day. Um, in our jobs, it's a very big problem. So there's no big mission planned to succeed Kepler. There are smaller missions planned in ESA, European Space Station, which just selected a mission kind of like Kepler, but to look at more close stars. We also have uh, one that's on the phasing study at NASA, and then there's other groups of people like myself who are building smaller missions that are cheaper that can look around very nearby stars. So we're going to see a phase change in the way things are done, that big Mars Science Laboratory things change away, because those are not going to be happening unfortunately, in your future. But other things are going on that are small. So I hope that answers your question. Um, okay. okay. Um, so <clears throat> my question is, you know how, like, right now, like, light takes from other, you know, systems take millions of years to reach us. So that, let's say, um, situationally, Earth is running out of natural resources and we need to go to another planet. Um, do we have any, like, Methods to know if that planet's kind of still there because we're seeing light that. Right, and that's a good question. <laughs> so, these, these, it's a question. So, I mean, the short answer is we don't know. Like, light from our sun takes eight minutes to get here. So, if there's a problem on our sun, we wouldn't know it for eight more minutes. And so, these other stars are not too far away. The ones we could hope to travel to would just be, you know, up to 10 light years away. But certainly, if you set it on your journey and you can travel 10 to speed of light, it's 100 years, you won't know what happened. And so actually it reminds me of this one of the stories I just read. And you know, being so busy, I only had time to read about three stories. But one of them was actually really good. It was about this, I'm not, the plot was a little different, but I'll tell you the background was that a spaceship had left with 15,000 people to go to other star systems. And their onboard telescope and computer could figure out which one had to have in the world, or the people on Earth could also tell them. But they didn't know which one they would be able to go to, because they didn't know if some they didn't talk about your scenario where something could go horribly wrong, but they weren't sure for the things we talked about. We couldn't see it specifically, we couldn't see the surface, we didn't know all the details. 
you know, they would have to go from star to star to star, and they have enough fuel to get to five stars, and that's where the tension in the story came in. But yes, if we are ever going to leave and go away, we won't know everything until we get there, and that's the problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One last question. So my question is, um, how do you define love? Well, okay. <laughs> We don't worry about that question at all because we don't worry about what life is, we just worry about what life does. And I told I mentioned before that we're gonna live in a very narrow space that life metabolizes and uses chemical processes to do so. So what is life is a huge question in the field of astrobiology, and there's no really great answer to it that I know of. But in exoplanets we don't worry about it. We just worry about because it's too hard, and we just worry about the science that life produces. Are there any other questions? All right, so the, there is a, uh, a lecture tomorrow in the physics department at 2.30. So if you're interested, please attend. And uh, we would just like to thank you by giving you this